Hello and welcome to this uh, Think Small Cell webinar where we put a couple of leading small cell industry analysts on the spotlight and ask them not just to give their forecasts and state of the market reports but also the underlying reasons for that. Um, during the After the presentations of each of the um, analysts I'll be asking a number of questions and if at any point during the event you'd like to submit a question then please do so using the panel to the right hand side of your screen. Um, the other housekeeping announcements are that uh, the show itself, the event, will be recorded and anybody who's attended will be sent an email link with um, uh, to the recording that you can view on demand later and equally the slides will also be made available. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the two analysts joining me today. First of all, Caroline Gabriel, Head of Research at Rethink Technology Research. Hello. And Joe Madden, Founder and Principal Analyst at Mobile Experts. Good morning, David. Hi, Joe. So um, before I hand over to each of those two in turn, um, I'd like to just first make a, a brief kind of state of the market um, analysis of the small cell industry today. Uh, and then after each of the analysts have uh, given their talk in turn, we'll have a Q&A session before wrapping up. So in terms of my piece, um, it's just this one chart that tries to summarize the key state of the small cell industry today. And often what we do is divide that into the four main market sectors, which really are quite significantly different. The residential sector, of course, um, provides the volume, um, over 10 million small cells deployed today residentially. And what we've seen over the, the last year or so is relatively few new operator deployments. Uh, but there have been some surprises. And I think the biggest one was last quarter in the USA when T-Mobile, who's a, a great proponent of Wi-Fi and voice over Wi-Fi at home, launched a, a dual mode 3G, 4G small cell. And that's available free of charge to um, subscribers on some of their postpaid plans. There's also a substantial number of residential small cells being deployed uh, every month. Uh, they're embedded at uh, Free France in their set-top boxes, arguably more towards saving uh, roaming costs and reducing the amount of spectrum that they require to deliver service throughout. Uh, one or two other of these large embedded deployments that people have been looking at, particularly in the UK here with BT and TalkTalk, Talk, are yet to happen, and the status of those is not entirely clear. But they could have a significant impact on the volumes shipped in the future. And I think the other factor that would affect things going forward is that as voice over 4G using Volte becomes uh, mature, then that might be a reason or a potential for an uptick of residential 4G only small cells, but we're not quite there yet. In the enterprise sector, it's arguably the most lucrative segment. Um, the, the value of these products is much higher. The cost per unit is much higher. And there is a, a split in the, the segment, perhaps between um, smaller buildings that might only need one or, or maybe up to half a dozen small cells to cover them, uh, and a, a smaller number but um, of a larger deployments, the medium to larger buildings, um, almost stretching into um, properties that would in the past have had DAS deployments. And we've heard some statements from major network operators about the growing credibility of these larger enterprise small cell solutions for larger buildings. It's still perhaps important at the moment to have both 3G and 4G technologies available. That is, um, differs depending on which region in the world you are. Uh, and an important factor uh, is, is whether you can support more than one network operator with a system. And there is an argument for some neutral host solution that would deliver that. 
Moving into the urban sector, this is one that's perhaps been the most disappointing to date. Uh, arguably, it's technically viable. It's all about 4G rather than 3G, but it's being held back by a whole range of issues from planning permission, um, obtaining the right sites, the logistics, and, and just the methods of deploying such products in the street. I would say that uh, it's likely to be LTE only products that will, will be successful in the long term in this segment. And I think that it will initially appear in targeted zones in dense urban environments. And so those aspects around the logistics, the third party deployment, the uh, automated um, self-optimizing networks are an important aspect. And last but not least, the rural sector um, perhaps not uh, large in terms of volume, but they're quite important if we are going to increase the coverage and bring mobile service uh, throughout the country. And that may be driven uh, by regulatory targets to increase the level of coverage. And an example of that might be here in the UK, where the plan is to use the commercial LTE network as part of the first responder solution in the long term. And so that will require very high levels of geographic coverage rather than just population coverage. So there's quite a lot of different factors involved in all these different segments. And so as an analyst, um, trying to make sense of that and even more difficult, put some numbers to it is a very difficult task. But I'm pleased to say that we have two people online who are going to give it their best shot. And first of all, I'm going to hand over to Caroline Gabriel uh, for her view of the um, forecast over the next three to five years. Over Thanks to you, Caroline. Very much. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Um, and welcome, everybody. Thank you for attending today. Um, as David said, I'm the uh, co-founder and head of research at Rethink Technology Research. We've been covering the mobile access network market since 2002 and we've been forecasting small cells since 2008 so uh, we've got a, re a reasonable track record on doing that. Um, our forecasts are uh, I guess somewhat complementary to the ones you hear from Joe as we um, base ours on uh, operators stated deployment intentions over five years. Um, they're based on an opt-in research base of almost 100 mobile carriers um, who give us their input on their, their sort of current state of, of their planning and, and estimates for what they expect to deploy. We sanity check that against vendor estimates, the operator's track record of deploying what they, they think they're going to deploy and other factors, but it's basically a demand side forecast. Um, we don't focus on the residential market in detail. Uh, but we analyze the non-residential small cells in four categories, as you'll see uh, in, the, in the graph on the slide. And that's uh, the enterprise split in two sections, public-facing enterprises such as malls and private enterprise networks, um, also the urban public market and rural. Um, and in all of those, we include, uh, include multi-mode cellular stroke Wi-Fi cells, as well as cellular only, but not Wi-Fi only and not DAOs, though we do produce separate forecasts for those. In these four sectors, um, as David's touched on in his introduction, it's fair to say that there have been some disappointed expectations in recent years. Some of that, of course, was down to overhype anyway. Um, and a lot was down to underestimation in some quarters, at least, of the challenges that are facing the enterprise and particularly the urban markets. And some of those I know we'll all discuss later. However, we have always believed that late 2016 and 2017 would be the tipping point for the non-residential small cells, and we do stick to that view. Um, we, we have revised our precise um, figures and trends over the years, but, um, but the overall curve remains similar. Um, we believe that the requirement to deploy is now becoming urgent in many scenarios, um, and the solutions are becoming more affordable and gradually more deployable. So the chart based on, on that starting point, the chart shows you a market growing at compound annual growth of 66% um, between 2014 and 2020, and reaching a total of around 4.5 million sites in 2020, with 3.5 million of those thereabouts being those two enterprise categories, and I mainly indoors. In fact, uh, at the end of the decade, we think 
about three quarters of the installed base, which by then will have reached about 13 and a half million, will be inside where, um, as I'm sure we all understand, the, the most urgent requirements for capacity and coverage and usage are felt. And the critical mass, as, as David has also alluded to, uh, will be in the enterprise. Carol, I can the next I... slide. Yes. Carol, can, can I just clarify that the graph shows the shipments per year rather than a cumulative total? Oh yes, uh, thanks for pointing to clarifying. Yes, uh, that's that's new sites deployed. So the cumulative install base um, by 2020 is about 13 and a half million minus sites that have been decommissioned and so on. Right. So when you compare that with um, about seven, what is it? About five, five or six million macrocell sites. That that's quite a significant number. Yes, and as we'll see, some of these sites. Um, are very small indeed. <laughs> yeah, that's much smaller than any that we're talking about in the current uh, the current time as we move to to some of the new, very very distributed architectures. So it's a big number, and they're not all. Uh, leads me very neatly to this next slide. In fact, they're not all the the fairly substantial um, small cells that we currently see in enterprise and urban markets. Um, some of those we expect to be very stripped down sort of radio antenna modules uh, connected to a virtualized platform. And we would count that as, as a small cell providing it's um, serving a site of its own. Um, however little that site may be, particularly when you start looking inside and looking at some of the very distributed architectures um, that are emerging. And we do think actually that the diversification of the small cell architecture um, is something that will help to drive growth. Um, traditionally, we've looked at a self-contained baseband antenna radio unit, that's a classic small cell. But um, having a, a choice of architectures, as we've seen in the macro layer, of course, um, will suit a wider variety of deployment conditions um, and help to drive adoption uh, for companies that have, that have different types of, of requirements in terms of cost, power, flexibility, and so on. Make it makes the platform a lot more adaptable while um, if, if bodies like the Small Cell Forum, um, you know, they're working hard to ensure that a lot of the basic interfaces between these different architectures remain common. So it is a common platform, but with many uh, different ways to slice and dice the, the equipment itself. And as I say, we've seen that in, in the macro base station as well. But by 2020, um, in our forecast, we believe that less than half of new small cells deployed will actually follow the traditional all-in-one architecture. And we're already seeing more distributed approaches coming in. Um, for instance, you see clusters of small cells in the enterprise um, or in, indeed for rural use or public safety use where you have several very small cells managed from a central controller or gateway just with just a single connection to the core, even from the cloud. And there'll be further evolution of those sort of platforms, um, particularly with virtualization in which the base station may be split at, at various points, and still under debate, but but basically with the radio antennas distributed and the baseband processing virtualized. And that might be in the gateway, the controller, or right up there in the cloud. And there'll also be some approaches, and you can, you can see all of these reflected in the graph. There'll be some approaches which involve driving a distributed antenna system from a small cell and combining those two approaches um, in a scenario where that might be optimal. So overall, we think by 2020, about 46% of new sites um, will be deployed with these newer architectures, which is about the same percentage as traditional small cells. But the highest growth, of course, will be on the virtualized side, um, which I suspect we'll discuss later in more detail. But we see a um, compound annual growth in that particular architecture of almost 160% over the period. And I. Um, I stress that there's a lot of ways to do virtualization, and not, a lot of these are not what we would call pure cloud run, um, but they are showing an element of pooling of the baseband resource, um, and quite often the use of NFV as a standard specification for how that's done. So moving to, sorry, David. Um, so, so just just again a clarification. This is quite separate deployments from what we have on site at Macrocell sites today. Yes. It's, it's additional, right? Yes, these are additional. Um, clearly, these architectures are also taking place in the macro layer, but this is um, specific to to the small cell layer where we've got um, the, sm the short range and the low power. And the other definitions of, um, of the small cell layer as opposed to macro remain the same, but just um, different splits between the equipment coming into play. Thank you. Thank you. And my, my final points um, for handing to Joe. 
are looking at the risks to the forecast, if you like, all the factors that might um, make it less optimistic or, or indeed more optimistic um, than what we currently believe. I think it's a tradition in this annual webinar. We always discuss why forecasts vary and um, what may cause a forecast to prove to be over or under optimistic because, uh, as we know, there have been some very um, perhaps wildly optimistic forecasts in this sector over the years. Um, and we do know there have been several sort of years when it's been supposedly the year of the small cell and expectations have not always been met. So what might affect um, what we're saying this year? You know, will we get to 2020 and say, yes, we were right? Um, what might change the pattern of how we get there? Um, there are certainly factors which may accelerate or slow the pace we expect to see obviously when we do these forecasts in detail for clients we have a we have a range um, we have a, a best case worst case approach so this is just a summary really but um, even if we get to the same end result in 2020 there may be different ways to get there um, so as well as doing our sheer forecast rethink conducts an annual survey of operators to ascertain the factors which would speed up or slow down their deployment plans for various technologies in their view um, in small cells, these drivers and barriers are certainly something of a moving target. And our most recent summary, which, was, um, uh, which you can see on the right, um, comes from late last year. And it showed that operators' concerns, the things that might slow them or hold them back in 2015, had already moved on from those from 2014. They've become more confident that the logistical challenges, like that call, can be addressed. It's not saying they have been addressed, but that they will be in their sort of um, targeted timeline to deploy. But they're starting to think ahead to far larger deployments um, in line with densification initiatives. Um, but that brings a whole new set of concerns, such as automation and scalability of the technology. So what the, the factors that might, uh, that might make a, an operator hesitate, um, they change all the time. I and mean, they have to keep track of those and how much they really are affecting the market and how much the industry is rising to the challenge of addressing them. So among the major risks that we see this time are basically that operators will always be waiting for the next big thing, which will improve small cell economics even more. So they waited for LTE to come along, they waited for open interfaces, they, opened for, they waited for integrated Wi-Fi. Now they're waiting for virtualization because they can see many advantages to that, but it's still over the horizon. That raises the risk that they will wait too long, they'll end up adopting other solutions, particularly carry Wi-Fi, which is becoming you know, quite enriched as a solution. They'll adopt those even as a stopgap and divert resources from small cells, which may not um, spoil the market long term, but may uh, delay or dilute it um, for, for the immediate future, the next two or three years. Um, a significant factor in that, especially in enterprise, is simplicity of deployment. I think small cells are still seen as being relatively complex, whether that's true or not, in terms of actual deployment. So there is a need for new cost deployment and service models, and particularly, as David already mentioned, for um, better multi-operator support. And of course, there may also be accelerators, um, the entry of non-traditional operators like cable companies into the market using small cells for leverage, I think, could be a major stimulus. Um, new spectrum options and improved regulatory conditions, both telecoms and planning regulators around the world, could all have the opposite effect and uh, speed things up compared to what we've presented today. So it's not a precise science, but um, I hope that at least there are some, some, good, uh, some good trends there to discuss and some food for thought, which I'll hand back to David. Thanks very much, uh, Caroline. That was excellent, and I think it just helps clarify or highlight how difficult your role is to, to make these um, quite difficult numeric forecasts. But um, we have another person who's prepared to do the same. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to Joe Madden, Founder and Principal Analyst at Mobile Experts. Joe. Okay, thank you very much, David. And uh, okay, yeah, here's our introduction slide. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Mobile Experts, we are a small uh, research company based in Silicon Valley, but with, uh, with expert analysts around in Canada and, and the UK and uh, the East Coast of the United States as well. And uh, our approach is to dive deep on the technology side. So we have analysts here that, that are 20 year experts in topics such as backhaul or synchronization, uh, Wi-Fi or base station design. Um, and uh, 
I, I like doing this webinar, David, because uh, uh, as Caroline said, uh, we do complementary approaches. Uh, Caroline takes a, a high-level view talking with uh, mobile operators and looking at uh, uh, their CapEx spending and so on. Uh, and uh, we do some of that with the mobile operators, but we, uh, we do that at a technical level where we compare cost models and, and technical models with the mobile operator uh, community. And uh, uh, I'll get into some of the details of that in a minute. Uh, but we compare that top-down forecast from the operators with a bottom-up forecast from uh, the supply chain, uh, from semiconductor vendors and the OEMs, uh, looking at the actual performance of different systems and, uh, and, and where would small cells actually be needed. Um, one of the relevant questions that we ask all the time is, what is the density of traffic uh, that would drive an operator toward a small cell solution? And, uh, and, and we found that to be a, a very accurate way to predict just where and when a mobile operator would put a small cell in place. So we use that approach to, to uh, do market analysis in macro base stations as well as these uh, small cells, DAS and Wi-Fi and other lower power solutions. Uh, we're now looking at 5G in terms of broadband and IoT applications. And, uh, and we've launched some research recently uh, where we're getting into the client device side of, of low power IoT solutions uh, ranging from the LPWA standards into LTE variations. Uh, let's go to the next slide and uh, start talking about the forecast. Um, now, one of the things that we've been doing and, and tracking for many years is, is, you know, what is the rise in shipments of small cells? Um, and frankly, it's been, it was flat for several years. And uh, as, as uh, both of you have mentioned earlier in the call, uh, there was a lot of disappointment in the industry. Uh, but I think really that can be seen as a realignment of the industry uh, away from the residential case and starting to look at the non-residential case. Um, and 2015 was, was actually quite an interesting year. We saw an increase in residential shipments from free, uh, and so that was, uh, that was a healthy bump upward. Uh, but uh, uh, sometimes people don't uh, see that the blue section of this chart, which is the enterprise section and the urban deployments, uh, which also had a healthy step upward last year. Uh, uh, and what I attribute that to is that, uh, you know, we see the mobile operators uh, getting more comfortable with these small cells and the, the self-configuring nature of the small cell. And uh, they're now more comfortable in, in deploying hundreds at a time instead of five or ten at a time. Um, uh, the way I've, I've said it to, to many of my clients is that uh, small cells were in field trial mode for many years where uh, the engineers from the mobile operator themselves would have to go out to every installation uh, to make sure that everything is working well. And, and frankly, they, the concern was that the small cell would, would do something to interfere with the macro layer. Uh, and I think many operators now are, are past that, and uh, they've, they've uh, concluded their, their trial phase to where now they're comfortable that the, these small cells can self-configure uh, and self-optimize themselves in a way that does not interfere with the macro network, especially for indoor applications. Uh, so we're, we're seeing a, a, a different kind of behavior from the mobile operators in order to uh, allow enterprises to deploy things with uh, local system integrators. And, uh, and frankly, the, the thing that really accelerated this market in the last year or so is that the, the engineers from the mobile operator don't have to show up for every installation. And uh, it, we see a lot of signs now that that trend is going to continue, that uh, the, the enterprise and urban segments will continue to grow in a healthy rate. Um, if, uh, if you take out the residential numbers here, then uh, actually I think my numbers are, are not too far off from what Caroline just showed. Uh, we're in the range of, of 5 million uh, non-residential small cells in the 2020 timeframe, uh, with the majority being enterprise and indoor urban small cells. Uh, so, uh, so from our point of view, we see uh, a similar picture to what Caroline had showed earlier. Um, sorry, Joe, can I just again clarify that this chart you're showing is annual shipments. It's not uh, cumulative. So That's last year, right. so last year, four million small cells shipped. <clears throat> Yes, that's right. And in fact, we, we do the tracking for the small cell forum here at Mobile Experts. So we, uh, we do have uh, some charts around the cumulative shipments. Uh, at the end of 2015, the number was about 12 million small cells that have been shipped uh, across all time. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's, that's the difference is that, uh, you know, here you're looking at the annual number. Thank you. 
Now let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here's our high level view. This is, you know, really backing off to look at the big picture of what's going on in mobile infrastructure overall. And, uh, and, and we, we think in terms of the capital spending, not just from the mobile operators, uh, but from enterprises that are now putting their own capital into this market. And, uh, and, and this is the part that I find the most interesting and really the most dynamic change in the market is that uh, over the last 20 years, we've expected the mobile operators to be the ones to pay for everything. Uh, but I think now with, with these enterprise small cell solutions, we're starting to see a trend toward enterprises funding these systems, uh, getting the approval of the mobile operator, of course, but, uh, but then uh, taking care of the systems integration and putting it in place and paying for the unit itself. Uh, which I think expands the, the pool of capital that's available. Um, uh, we have a kind of a natural trend every time we go through a generation. 2G did this and 3G we did this. And again, now with, with LTE, we in the macro base stations, we have a surge of spending. Uh, that sort of peaked for us in the 2014 timeframe for, for the LTE cycle. And, and now we're, we're starting a sort of a downward slide in terms of capital that's being allocated toward macro base stations. And we're starting to see some mobile operators reallocating their capital toward small cells. Um, they've already been spending on DAS to some extent, but I think we're seeing more and more uh, the, the mobile operators seeing that densification of the network is really the challenge today. Uh, not additional widespread coverage, but, but additional capacity in the cities. And so the, the capital spending is starting to turn toward small cells and away from the macro. Uh, another interesting trend is that uh, uh, people talk about DAS. Um, in fact, I've heard recently that DAS is dead. Uh, that you know that catchphrase has has been uh, circulating through the industry, but I don't see it that way at all. Uh, I think you know, mobile operators have have sort of plateaued in their spending on DAS, and we've in fact we've seen some mobile operators really cut back on on the number of stadium projects and other things that they're funding. Uh, but uh, the enterprises are now picking up that slack. So uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, hospitals or hotel chains or other enterprises that have uh, the neutral host requirement uh, latching onto DAS systems. And, and, uh, and, and we see the DAS systems um, morphing and changing as, as, as the nature of the product uh, to, to satisfy that, that need uh, better than the old DAS operator product could have. Uh, so, so we see a bright future for, for DAS as well on a, on a growth track through 2020. And then at the bottom we have, we have carrier Wi-Fi independently of, of the small cell and the, uh, the mobile infrastructure. There is ongoing spending with cable operators and with mobile operators on, on carrier Wi-Fi access points. Um, it's not really as clean as these separate lines would indicate because I think to, the, to a large degree carrier Wi-Fi will be tied up altogether with, with DAS and small cells. And uh, you know, this is really a, a way for me to, to illustrate the way I think that capital spending is shifting in the industry. Let's go to the next slide. I, I wanted to illustrate uh, what I mean by the rise of enterprise spending. I, I, I've talked with many people recently who, who don't understand what this is really about. And I think uh, what's important to understand is that with a small cell, uh, the original idea was that the operator really had to be the one to, uh, to put that unit in the field, uh, that it had to be very tightly controlled by the operator, and uh, that they had to be the one to select the location where it would be installed and so on. Uh, but but as uh, the maturity of the small cell technology has, has grown over the last five years, uh, we've reached a point now where, where the small cell does uh, self-configure itself in such a way that it, it, it recognizes the macro layer around it. it. It doesn't interfere with that. And now the operators are comfortable with allowing an enterprise to buy a unit, put it in, uh, and uh, that, that that system throughout the building will, uh, will operate without any impact on their overall network. Uh, so in 2014, we saw a healthy rise in, in the number of enterprise small cells being deployed, as well as a healthy rise in DAS systems uh, being deployed by the enterprise. And, uh, and we see that trend continuing in 2016 now. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, that, that, to me, a very exciting change in the industry. And you see, you know, this is, this is a pretty dramatic shift from 2012 to 2020, going from only 5% of, of total 
uh, in-building infrastructure being funded by enterprises to uh, something like a quarter of it. Um, and I, I don't think it stops there. I think, I think the mobile business is really becoming an IPT business. And uh, more and more as we see these, these arrangements between Ericsson and Cisco, uh, between Ericsson and HP for that matter, uh, we're seeing the industry realigning itself to become more like the IT business. Sorry, Joe, could I just again ask for clarification here? Um, the, the, the actual project cost that's being uh, funded or shared by the enterprise, is that just the DAS system or whatever in-building uh, equipment is deployed? Or would you also include um, a funding or, or a contribution towards the, the base stations that each network operator might bring in to drive that? Yeah, this, this chart reflects both DAS and small cells together, uh, so what I call in-building infrastructure for mobile. And uh, this, this reflects the cost of the, the, the actual uh, RF equipment, uh, you know, uh, whether that's antennas and cabling and, and small cells or DAS, uh, and the, uh, the construction cost of putting that in. Great. Thanks very much. On to the next slide. Yeah, let's go to the last slide here. And uh, uh, here's another way to look at things. I, I, I don't like to use the word virtualization with small cells. And, and the reason for that is that I think it, in, in, in the IT business especially, virtualization carries a connotation of, of running a, a process on a standard Dell server or something like this. And I don't think that's exactly what we're doing here in the mobile infrastructure market. Uh, we are centralizing the baseband processing function. And so we use remote radio heads, uh, what I designate here as RRH, uh, in, in the deployment of, of small cells and other, other radio systems now. Um, but uh, I, I've stayed away from the term virtualization when I refer to these units. I, I think of them more as centralized baseband processing. And uh, I do think we're going to get to a virtualized network, uh, but that the timing for that to begin is, is really still a couple of years out. Uh, so we, we've done a, a pretty in-depth study of, of what some of the uh, technical barriers are between where we are today and a true virtualized RAN. And, and I think we still have a couple of years of development before we get there. Um, having said that, we do have a variety of, of solutions, as Caroline indicated. Um, and uh, as, as we shift from this all-in-one small cell concept, to a centralized baseband concept or some kind of a, a controller that, that manages 20 or 30 small cells in a building, uh, I think there's, there's real value in that. Uh, so uh, we see a, a pretty healthy rise in the percentage of small cells that will be deployed in that format. So David, before you ask the question, this to clarify, the, this reflects the, uh, the number of shipments of some kind of low power radio base station. Uh, right, right. Rather than over time, what that what that mix will evolve to, whatever that is. Um, great. Now I've, we're in the Q and A session. We've we've got one or two questions already coming in for you, but we'll uh, we'll move on to that in due course. Okay. Um, does that sorry? Well, does that complete we're... anything else to to say, Joe? No, I think that'll do it. Uh, let's let's go ahead and and go from there. I'd, I'd love to hear some feedback from from the audience on you know what what they're interested in uh, seeing in the market today. Yeah, um, well, we've certainly got a few questions come in, and um, I would say if anybody else does want to submit one, now is a a good time. But before we move into the Q and A um, session, we'd like to ask the audience a poll. Um, Often at this stage in the webinar, we say, you know, do you have confidence and do you agree with the forecasts that have been given? But this time, we'd like to highlight one of the uh, common questions that comes up, which is whether for the success of in-building small cells, is uh, macro cell feature parity essential? So does that mean that you have to have all of the latest LTE advanced features replicated exactly in an in-building system in order for it to be able to be successful? Um, or can you operate with without some of those? You know, perhaps it doesn't have all of the full carrier aggregation peak speed capabilities. Um, perhaps it doesn't have some of the uh, EICIC options, but perhaps it, it gives a, a very good service. So with that, I'll, I'll launch a poll uh, that should be coming up on your screen now. And as you can see, if we if you could just uh, give an indication of whether you believe 
it's absolutely essential that the features and capabilities of any in-building system match exactly what's available outside um, or whether it's just a good thing to have or, or really it's not essential as long as basic service you know voice good data text etc is uh, capable then that's um, you know acceptable and it's good enough and if you don't know then then please say that as well Right, the votes are coming in. 70% of people have voted. So if I could ask you just to make your choice now, um, we'll close the poll in five, four, three, two, one, close. And again, you should see the results shown on your screen now. 40% um, believe that uh, you know, it's not essential. Um, you like most of the features available. A good quarter of the audience think that, yes, it is absolutely essential. And about 20% believe that it's it's not that important. Um, any reaction to that uh, result? Um, Caroline, do you want to give a comment? Yeah, um, I think that's pretty much what we would hear from from operators, uh, I think vendors tend to talk about parity because it's obviously challenging and um, to deliver. But I think most operators are prepared to make some compromises um, in, in the because basically what they're looking for is is better capacity and coverage. I don't think they need absolutely every feature. They, I think they have the feeling they've built the features into the macro cell over so many years and with so much engineering effort that it's unrealistic to to want parity um, in in the small cells as well, and they don't really want to pay for that either. And, and Joe, any comments from, from you? You know, and Sure. Well, you know, I think one of the, the things that uh, came out early on in the small cell discussion is that the mobile operators wanted to use the same software without any changes at all between the macro layer and small cells. And what that would do is, is to give this, the operator some confidence uh, that the small cell software is not introducing something weird and different and it has to be thoroughly tested. Um, and uh, and I, I think there's absolute value in that uh, because we know that the, the macro base stations can be installed and work together with each other and surrounding base stations and so on. Um, so that, that concept of using exactly the same software so that we know what we're installing uh, has been very useful. Uh, the fact is that most operators, I think, now are reaching the point where they, they understand that, okay, it works, and they're getting beyond that. Um, and everyone knows that you don't need the mobility of driving 100 miles an hour when you're inside a building. <laughs> so it's clear that most features uh, features can be useful, uh, but there are some features that are really not necessary. Uh, so to the extent that those can be streamlined, uh, you know, I think that, that process has begun now. Great. Thanks very much. Um, so if we move on to the uh, Q&A session now, we've had a number of questions uh, around particularly the enterprise sector. Um, one of the most common themes seems to be around neutral host and how important is that? You know, if one, one of the questions suggests, you know, when when would you not want uh, a, a neutral host? But just um, with that in mind, you know, what what are the you know factors that have been holding back growth in the enterprise sector, and and what bottlenecks re remain? Um, if I if I ask uh, Caroline first. I do think neutral host is one, although I think that's been one that has become significant fairly recently as enterprises start, uh, and operators also, start to think in terms of bigger scale and of different business models they, which might justify their build out. I, I think more fundamentally than that, and particularly in the private sort of enterprise sector, which is still the bulk of it, um, I think it's actually more to do with with the way that these small cells come to market, who deploys them and how is that shared and how do all the stakeholders in an enterprise um, sort of share responsibility because it's so much more complicated than, than in the public mobile operator network uh, in that you've got, you've got integrators, IT departments, the mobile operators themselves, you, you may well have landlords taking an interest. Um, so I think that's been the most basic inhibitor and no one's quite got it right. There is, each of these enterprise deployments, if it's at any scale, is very handcrafted, not just in the network itself, but in how everybody joins in and shares the cost and shares the responsibility for 
uh, keeping it running and um, and shares the, any revenue that might accrue. And I think there needs to be much more of a sort of simple template basis almost. So these are the ways you can do it, uh, which existed more um, more commonly in Wi-Fi. Uh, so to me, that's number one bottleneck. I think I think multi-operator is another one, but I think that's one that's sort of only really just emerging now as people start to think in, in bigger scale and more about public-facing venues. Right, uh, Joe. You know, we've done a study here of, of mobile infrastructure for the enterprise where we looked at DAS and small cells together and, and tried to segment the market into what I would call private buildings where, where a single operator solution can be successful uh, versus public buildings where you really need to have multiple operators supported in, in whatever mobile infrastructure is installed. And, uh, you know, from our point of view, there's, there's a gigantic market potential out there. It's in, in north of a $100 billion market potential. Uh, but uh, the majority of that, maybe more than 70% of that, is is public in nature. Uh, so that that multi-operator support is is absolutely essential for for most buildings. Um, uh, you know, I think the exceptions would be uh, something like a corporate headquarters, uh, uh, some kind of an enterprise where where most of the people inside the building. 90% uh, of the people inside the building share the same mobile service. And in that sort of a case, um, you know, a, a single operator small cell solution uh, can be successful. And I think that's where we've seen some of the growth here so far. Uh, getting the products right to, to, to have those kinds of solutions handling multiple operators in, in, a, in a really um, uh, in a way that the operators can approve of, uh, I think that that has yet to come together. Um, and then a second thing that I think it really has to come together for the for the industry to take off on the enterprise is that the sales channel hasn't been quite right. You know, we've we've had some small companies going out there to sell their product to uh, to mobile operators. Uh, you know, that that's really not the sales channel that you need to sell to millions of enterprises. Um, you know, I think the industry needs to realign, and uh, I mentioned Ericsson and Cisco earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, I think those kinds of arrangements with, with IT companies working together with mobile infrastructure companies uh, to really make use of an existing IT sales channel, uh, that's an important part of, of getting the industry aligned so that the product can start to match up with what the channel wants, and then, and then it'll take off. Thanks. Um, and just again, a, a quick clarification question from one of the uh, the viewers um, relating to your forecast. When you were, if you were talking about a, a centralized RAN or a, you know some of these centralized controller um, enterprise small cell solutions, um, would you categorize that as um, one shipment, or would you um, count those per per I guess radio head as part of your total? Right. Yeah, that's a good question, and uh, and it has to do with the uh, the nature of the baseband processing. If if the baseband processing is primarily in the radio unit itself, uh, then we count that as a shipment. Uh, but uh, for for some of the ones where the the radio unit is is uh, I extremely simple, uh, mm -hmm. for example, the radio dot, uh, I would consider the the central radio head to be uh, the shipment, and then there would be multiple dots supported for each radio head. Right. Yeah, so I, I think that was just uh, one of the questions that, that uh, it helps to clarify. Um, Caroline, I, I think you did, um, I think you were fairly clear in, in what you, you know, how you break that down, but do you want to just um, restate your view of, you know, is a centralized RAN system uh, one or count as, as multiple in your uh, thousands of sites forecast? Yeah, I'd take um, almost precisely the same viewpoint as Joe. Um, in, the, in, in most cases, we do count each individual radio head or site as one, um, but if they're highly simplified and attached to a, a sort of larger radio head or centralized one, we, we'd count that as, as the one. So radio dot definitely being the best example of that. So I think, I think we're on the same line as Joe. Okay. Um, right, there's a few more comments on, on, on enterprise, but I think um, probably helpful if we move on to the urban sector we've got a few more um, questions relating to that um, again you know the, we said at the outset you know the the sector seems quite sluggish um, one of the viewers comments that here in the UK it's been principally held back by deployment issues um, 
what are what are these factors uh, that that are constraining you know faster deployment and is there any country in the world where where either they don't apply or they've managed to get around them um caroline yes i mean urban is really interesting i think there's been a balance up till now of there are very complicated issues around deployment, as, as we know about that, call, but, um, but perhaps even more than that, um, site acquisition, planning regulations. We've seen all the recent submissions to the FCC about simplifying um, all their planning red tape in, in the US to allow for, um, for small cells. So I think there's been that. And, and I, to be honest, I think there hasn't been quite enough urgency or, or need for the mobile operators to do anything really drastic to address these problems because most of them you know have, have very new macro level LTE deployments and so when they're outside in the urban environment it's a, it's been a fairly unusual situation where those are coming to their to their ceiling of, of uh, capacity already um, and they've had things like Wi-Fi offload to help out um, in in those the areas where they are hitting problems so i think we're just getting to the point where that is changing and they are genuinely going to have to densify to to give a decent um user experience in the city centers so i think there'll be a much greater urgency and a lot more pressure put on uh, everyone involved to uh, to simplify the regulatory uh, situations and to take away some of the red tape it, but it will take longer, and, and a lot of the operators' over-optimism is always that, I mentioned it earlier, they, as a body, they have quite a lot of confidence that these sort of issues are addressable now. They can see the way that they will be addressed, but they always seem somewhat over-optimistic about how quickly authorities um, will, will actually respond and, and implement those new ideas. So I guess the countries that will be interesting to see whether it works more easily will be ones with a much more um, controlled approach, like China. I mean, when China's big urban centres get really congested, their structure gives them, I think, the capability to put new um, new regulations and templates into place very quickly and to impose them um, very efficiently. Whether they do that is another matter, but um, that's the one I'd have my eye on that could take lead in this and really show us how it could be done. I think all of that, and you know, very um, valid and, and helpful insights. Um, Joe, what's your perspective? Well, I think uh, Caroline hit on the issue of urgency with mobile operators, and and the the way we've been looking at that, uh, the last three years, we've been studying something uh, that relates to the density of traffic in cities. Uh, what we found in uh, Japan and Korea is is it, with the uh, the earliest large scale uh, urban small cell deployments. Uh, was that uh, when each of those locations, when each neighborhood reached the level of density of, of 20 megabits per square kilometer per megahertz of spectrum. So let me take that slowly and just, just say that that's the, the amount of traffic that's going through the air for each square kilometer of area in each megahertz of spectrum. When that's more than 20 megabits, uh, they reach a point where the macro base stations are really saturated and, and putting more high-level rooftop or tower sites is, is really counterproductive. Uh, and so that's when the operator is forced, uh, just for capacity reasons, to go to small cells at a, at a much lower antenna height and much lower uh, RF power. Uh, so using that technical model, we've, we've gone around and looked at other networks in Mexico City and the United States and the UK and India, other places like this, where we've, we've uh, charted out what is the traffic density in each of these locations. And that model has been remarkably accurate at predicting which cities in the United States would get small cells first, uh, how many might they need, and so on. And uh, and so we've we've been able to to use that as a tool for predicting, you know, just where does the urban small cell happen? And uh, if the if the growth in mobile traffic uh, and the growth of Wi-Fi offloading both happen at the rate that they are today, uh, you know, that's where our forecast comes from. Great. You know, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see uh, the, the various strategies or, or statements made by municipalities as they formulate a plan um, and decide what they're going to permit in terms of deployment and how much they're going to support it. Um, related to the urban deployment, of course, is the backhaul that's, that's used. And I've certainly heard um, some, um, some views that it'll almost all be fiber. Um, 
whereas you know the speed at which you can deploy that and and that varies in each region uh, may make that uh, quite difficult so so i suppose my question is will there be a, a market for for wireless backhaul you know is it is it all going to be fiber in these uh, urban and and secondly are we going to see uh, new entrants you know the cable companies uh, cable operators could be very well positioned to to um deploy a lot of these urban small cells on behalf of the network operators um caroline is is you know what's your view on on both of those aspects um yes i think uh, i think one of the problems of why we have uh, over high expectations sometimes in the small cell market is because we continually refer to a small handful of operators who are, who are completely atypical um, and and have been able to be uh, to lead the market um, because because of things like their access to fiber and, and I think you know, the example of Verizon mandating fiber is is a good one. You know, Ninety percent of the operators in the world will not be able to emulate what Verizon has done with LTE um, or with small what it will do with small cells. So. Um, I think there will be a big market for non-fibre that call because most operators won't have a choice. I mean, I, I don't think anyone would argue that ideally they would like affordable fibre to every cell, but, um, but we only have to look around the world to see how rare that is, particularly once you get outside of, um, of urban centres. So um, I, I think the wireless backhaul technologies have evolved a lot, um, and some of them are becoming very usable. I, I think the enormous amount of R&D investment around the world that's going into millimetre wave spectrum will benefit that as well as access. Um, I think the side effect of a lot of those technologies, which have had quite a small target market and have been in the hands of, of small startups, suddenly becoming the heart of some, some really big development initiatives. So I think the technology will evolve very rapidly for high frequency wireless backhaul. Um, and definitely, I think the cable companies are um, in certain countries are a significant factor. Um, the fact that they want to use small cells for their own um, sort of multi-play services and, and their ability to sell backhaul, to offer their cables as backhaul for others. Uh, and again, coming back to China and seeing what those cable companies have just been talking about doing over the last few weeks um, with, with LT and, and using cable as backhaul. Um, you know, we, sh we should not only be looking at the USA, uh, where the fibre situation is very unusual, um, or, or to Japan or Korea. We should look at what um, a lot of other countries mm -hmm. um, are doing, and there'll, there'll be a whole combination of, of backhaul. And, and I, I do think the technology for those non-fibre um, backhaul mechanisms is, is evolving very quickly now. Thanks. And, and Joe, uh, I wonder if in your answer you could also uh, comment on, on, on one question. Is it sensible to have a combined small cell and... and um, wireless backhaul product um, is is that uh, something that's likely to grow in in the future, or will we see them uh, mostly as separate units, which they are today? I think we will see them combined, and in fact, uh, this year you'll see some deployment uh, with Sprint in the United States of a, a combined small cell backhaul unit that uses wireless backhaul. Um, and that, that'll be in some significant quantity. Uh, so uh, we have a pretty healthy forecast here for wireless backhaul um, that, that comes from really that, that, that same question of economics. Uh, we, you know, I, I think Caroline has a good point that the, the operators that have fiber, uh, the NTT Docomo and SKT type of network where the, the fiber is really uh, very close to that ideal small cell location, um, it makes it uh, much less expensive to get fiber there and, and to utilize that. Um, Verizon has a unique uh, process, they have the unique potential of having very high ARPU and a, a very high um, uh, customer base that can support investment in the Cadillac sort of network, mm. uh, but uh, but that is atypical. And I, I think you know when you look at just the raw economics, uh, and uh, and not thinking in terms of the the ultimate in performance, but what's good enough uh, to run an LTE network. Uh, I think uh, wireless backhaul is is really a better solution in many many cases. Uh, so once we see a breakout here in uh, in 2016, I do think that there will be a, a healthy percentage of the market that will move toward wireless backhaul. Thanks. Yeah, I, I saw a, a figure quoted of $100,000 um, for the, the total 
life cycle cost of, of one of Verizon's small cells, um, which I thought, you know, is, isn't sustainable in, in many other markets. So that kind of reinforces your point. Um, okay, one other topic that we haven't actually touched on so far, but which certainly has um, livened up uh, panels in the last year is around the use of unlicensed spectrum. Um, you know, we've seen the, the proposals for LTEU, for LAA, uh, which should be standardized this coming year, as well as some kind of shared spectrum at 3.5 gigahertz. Um, how do you both think that's going to uh, impact the market um, and, and affect your forecasts? Caroline? Um. In 5 gigahertz, I've been quite a skeptic of LTEU and LTE-LAA, and, and I remain something of one. I, I think it will be used and it will have its purpose, but um, I think the politics around that band and the huge installed um, incumbency of Wi-Fi will limit its, its real usable impact. So that's not really affecting... Uh, my forecast hugely at this stage. Um, I think 3.5 and other bands that may emerge on a um, licensed or shared license sort of um, basis are much more interesting. I think 3.5 in particular, you know, has got huge potential for um, for small cells, uh, and they're already factored into our forecast really. But um, but certainly, if there's a more flexible approach to that spectrum in in certain markets around the world, we're already seeing in in the US, of course. Um, that could open up the use to lots of new types of service providers, um, such as the cable codes, um, then I think that could be a real accelerant. Um, so for me, three and a half is, is really interesting, specifically from a small cell point of view and, and broadening the addressable market for small cells. Five gig um, technically is interesting, but um, I remain skeptical that, it's, that there's going to be an awful lot of practical usage for um, LTLAA when, when you've got Wi-Fi and, and voice over Wi-Fi and all the rest of it sitting there. Thanks. What, what's your view, Joe? Well, I think the unlicensed spectrum is extremely important to the mobile business. And, you know, as we uh, project the future of, of how mobile data will be carried over the air, uh, in the 2020 time frame, roughly 90% of, of data will be going over some unlicensed band uh, with, with about 10% of the data. The critical control data and, and uh, high priority data will be over LTE. Um, so it's becoming more and more symbiotic over time. Uh, I'm not saying that Wi-Fi and unlicensed uh, modalities are more important than licensed. Uh, in fact, I, I believe the opposite. But uh, but I think as as uh, the traffic more and more gets separated from the control plane, uh, we're going to see the LTE network controlling what's happening out there and uh, the unlicensed modes carrying the, the heavy lifting. Um, so, you know, we've done a forecast of, of LWA traffic versus LAA traffic. Uh, you know, where will each of those be deployed and what's the, the net impact on how the, uh, how the handsets are going to adapt in terms of what radios need to be in handsets, uh, how the infrastructure will adapt. Um, right now, our view is that LWA is, is most likely going to be a very popular standard with, with uh, the majority of mobile networks. Um, because you can make use of, of widespread resources that are out there in the Wi-Fi networks that exist today. And uh, I think the LWA standard has the potential to evolve into this idea of an always best connected sort of scenario. Um, any, any LTE operator that doesn't have perfect coverage throughout their, their service area uh, can rely on Wi-Fi in some cases, and I think that standard will evolve so that uh, you can seamlessly move from a Wi-Fi only to LTE only and, and shared coverage areas uh, uh, without dropping your sessions and so on. Um, on the other hand, LAA is a good way for for operators that have a very strong LTE network uh, to reduce the cost of delivering data. Uh, so those uh, those operators we talked about before, SKT and Docomo and China Mobile and Verizon, uh, may be more inclined to use LAA wherever possible because because that that takes that L LTE network that they have and just just uh, allows them to streamline that and, and use the the strong LTE coverage 
for um, excellent anchoring and control of the, the signals uh, while carrying the data itself on the cheapest possible mode. Thanks, Joe. I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in it, and it's uh, a topic that's going to play out a lot over the next year to see you know what direction and interest there is on, on the various uh, options. Quite a complex one. Um, so thanks for your answers both. Um, I think we're just about out of time, but before we close, um, first of all, I'd like to ask the audience whether um, they thought the forecasts that they've just heard over the last year and the opinions that you've heard um, are too optimistic and too aggressive and, and should be lower, whether they're about right, um, or whether in fact you think small cells are going to take off even more quickly. Um, so on your screen now, you have the opportunity to vote, and please um, please do so. And uh, I'll just warn both of our, our guests that uh, after the poll, I'll just be asking them to consider if, if they have, you know, one, um, I would say, milestone or, or facet of the industry that they think we should look out for during 2016 that will perhaps uh, indicate how accurate and how well they've forecast the future. So I'll just I'll just close the uh, the poll. I've got about seventy percent people voted so far. So please vote now. Closing in five, four, three, two, one. Now. And uh, I think our two guests can be uh, very pleased that half the uh, viewers think they're about right. About a quarter of them think they're actually too optimistic. <laughs> but, but but interestingly, nobody, pretty much nobody thinks um, you're too pessimistic, which uh, which is uh, hopefully a good a good indicator. That's a um, big change for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's it's you're putting yourself out to. Um, anything from, from ridicule to, um, to skepticism. And, and it is a difficult role that you perform, but I think the fact that you're able to explain what's going on behind your analysis is extremely helpful. So thanks for that. Um, and as I say, just as a closing thought, uh, I wonder if there, is there one particular facet of the small cell industry or, or the technology that you think we should be keeping an eye out for over the, the next year ahead that will validate your views? Um, Caroline, what, what would you say to that? Um, I think it probably, for me, it probably is the emergence of um, some really usable multi-operator platforms, and particularly because a big factor of our forecast is that small cells should enable new types of service providers and not be entirely the preserve of the uh, traditional mobile operators. So we see that in the enterprise, but I, I think the multi uh, the multi-operated platforms are going to be essential to that. Mm. Interesting, you know, especially if, if the enterprise is going to be paying uh, a, a greater contribution of the cost. Joe, what's, exactly. your, what's, what's your thought, uh, Joe? You know, one of the metrics that I like to focus on is the size of each deployment. Uh, we, we went from talking about one small cell being deployed and how that works uh, to 10 small cells. Uh, now we see Verizon doing hundreds of small cells in San Francisco. Uh, I'm hoping to hear about thousands and tens of thousands this year. Yeah, so, so just uh, keep an eye out for those reports and those developments. And uh, what better place could you find to do that than Think Small Cell? And so uh, I would hope that most of the viewers are already familiar with uh, with our website, signed up for our newsletter, uh, and keep an eye on on what we're uh, talking about there. So it's it's now time for me to thank both of our guests, Caroline and Joe, for your contribution today. I thought that was an excellent uh, webinar. I really appreciated the views that you shared. Um, and equally, uh, thanks to the audience for your time listening today. And with that, we'll close the webinar. Thank you. <laughs>